I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 34, in the NIV version. And it says, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus and her sons, with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these, son, one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and, and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at, at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the, with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and asked, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high official exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be, my serv must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The, cr the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the, lou all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. What Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they, they recovered their sight and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing this morning? Um, what a privilege it is for, for myself and for my family to be with you all this morning. It was so much nostalgia, seeing faces we haven't seen in such a long time, meeting new faces that we've never met. Um, just to say I'm bringing greetings from Edenvale Baptist Church, as Reno said. Um, yeah, they're so excited. They're praying for the service today. What a privilege it is for us, yeah, to be, to be reminded that we're all part of the same kingdom. Big letter C, church, as we say. Thank you to the leadership here um, at Fellowship City for entrusting me to preach God's word this morning. You may ask yourself, am I not, am I not hot in the suit? I'm very hot. It's toasty. It's a long story. I may take off the jacket at some point. I come from a tradition and theological training where the preacher wears a suit, and now it's a two-year anniversary and celebration. So I'm honoring you. It's just, I'm honoring you. I'm, I'm trying to honor the Lord, you know, so <laughs> praise God. Um, but please, I, I accept your grace if at some point I must take off the jacket. We're so excited. Praise God for two years. Praise God. I see the, 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 the slogan at the bottom is the goodness and faithfulness of God. What a privilege. May, 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 may we not, there's no such thing as over celebrating. May we not be afraid of, of saying thank you, Jesus, because this is all God. This is all God. This is a, a testament of the goodness indeed and the faithfulness of the God that we serve. So, what a privilege. And so I've been tasked with preaching God's word this morning, and so we're going to get straight into it. For those of you who stayed up late watching the rugby, I trust you've recovered. Um, praise God. It seems we may have one more time that uh, the box will put us through what they've been putting us through for two times. Three times a charm, they say, right? Um, but it, it'll, be, it'll, be the, it'll be worth it this, this final time, we trust. Um, I trust you have your Bibles with you. Please turn to Matthew chapter 20. Verse 17 to 34, as you would have seen. Uh, from the outset, it would seem as though these are three seemingly separate, unrelated encounters. 
There's a fourth, if you were to add the parable of the workers in the vineyard from Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16. But as we will soon find out, a deeper study confirms and shows us it's all part of the same message. It's about serving. Jesus is talking to his disciples and in fact teaching them about what servanthood looks like. This morning, Fellowship City, we will be talking about serving and and you serve so well. Praise God. May God help us to, to serve even better and even more consistently. As we're celebrating the goodness and faithfulness and favor of God over the past two years, typical of God, we celebrate, but he also gives us work to do. There's a mission that we're all a part of. There was the Great Commission, and so we can't rest on our laurels. We can't get comfortable because we look back now at the good things that God has done in and through you. There's work to be done. And this morning, it's a reminder that as we step into the next decade and the next many more decades, we must remember what it's about. It's about looking at Jesus and following his example. And he was the ultimate example when it came to sacrificing himself for the sake of others. And so this message on serving was strongly impressed on my heart as I prayed and prepared for the message for us this morning. And so may the Lord be with us as we respond to his goodness and faithfulness through serving. Indeed, the best way to celebrate something good that we have is by sharing it with others. As we experience a goodness from God, may we take that same goodness and allow others to experience that goodness. And so as we look at serving this morning, may the Lord help us recognize the importance of serving others in the advancement of the kingdom. For those of you who take notes, the title of our message is Serve Like Jesus. Three points we'll be looking at, the first of which is, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. Our second point is, it's all about Jesus. Everything. It's all about Jesus. Therefore, our third point, let us serve others like Jesus served. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask that you may be with us this morning. We thank you that as we look back at two years, as we look back at more years prior to that leading up to where we are and where the church is today, that it's all because of you. And so we pray this morning, Heavenly Father, that you may speak to us. May you prepare the hearts and minds of your people this morning to hear from you. I pray, Lord God, that everything that comes out of my mouth may be straight from your heart. Allow me to focus and emphasize on the things that you want your people to hear. And so help us this morning to be receptive to your word as we look back and we thank you and we celebrate. Help us to also look forward and look at how you can continue to use us in a mighty way. Be with us this morning, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So to be faithful to the text, we must start with context. If you look at verse 16, it, it, it reminds us, so, so, so just one verse before we started our story, the, the, the previous story concluded with Jesus saying, the first will be last and the last will be first. If you look at when that story started in, in Matthew 20 verse 1, Jesus started, uh, the text tells us that it's for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. So we see that it's talking about giving an explanation of what the kingdom of God was like with Jesus using this parable of the workers in the vineyard. When you have time, read that story. It's a very fascinating parable that helps us understand something very unique about the God that we serve. But before that, in Matthew chapter 19, it concludes verse 30 by by saying, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So Matthew 19 verse 30 and Matthew 20 verse 16, it actually switches the words around for those of you who like the details. Prior to that, in Matthew 19 verse 27, Peter had said, but Lord, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? He's asking... We've sacrificed everything. What do we get? Okay? That was in response to the fact that a few verses before that in Matthew 19, 21, 
Jesus was talking to this rich individual, and the instruction was, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give them to the poor, then come and follow me. That was preceded by the start of that story in Matthew 19, verse 16, where this individual says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? The context of this message and these stories is eternal life, kingdom life, where we're talking about the kingdom of heaven and we're understanding what the kingdom of God is like, how it works, how we get there, what it entails, its characteristics. In this conversation about the kingdom of God, Jesus then emphasizes one thing. We see it in chapter 19, verse 13. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. We see it in Matthew 20, verse 16. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Then we see it explicitly in Jesus teaching the disciples in verse 26 to 28 of our story. Not so with you, he says. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. So, the kingdom mindset, the kingdom of God, is one that is not about self. It's about having, having the thought about thinking about others and meeting their needs. It's not about our needs being met. It's about sacrificing self. It's about giving up self for the sake of others, to serve others. Jesus not only taught us this in speech, he showed us in action. He sacrificed himself time and time again. He gave up his life for you and I. So we look to him, we learn from him how we are to live, we are to serve. The title of our message is Serve Like Jesus. That's the takeaway. To serve like Jesus starts with us understanding that it's not about you. I don't want to be a bit Pentecostal and charismatic, but turn to your neighbor and say, it's not about you. And then turn to your other neighbor and say, it's not about you either. And then tell yourself, it's not about you. It's always a fun statement to hear, isn't it? Some of us in this room need to hear that more than others. Do you have that friend that makes everything about them? Don't look to your left or right. <laughs> well, in reality, if we're going to be honest, many of us do it more than we'd like to admit. The disciples were no different. So in verse 21 in our story, we see, what is it you want, Jesus says to the mother of Zebedee's sons. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in the kingdom. Remember, the context is kingdom life. We're looking ahead. Verse 24, it says, and the, the, the other ten, when they heard this, they were indignant with the two brothers. By the way, Mark chapter 10 verse 35 reminds us that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we want for you to do us a favor. What do you want? Jesus said, they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. Some of us might say, yeah, no, it's the mother who was being problematic. No, no, no. <laughs> it was indeed James and John themselves who asked Jesus and said, we want this place of honor. They were living with the Messiah Day to day, and yet, I guess for their credit, we must give them, they, they had vision. Eh? They said, I, this life shop, Mara, that life, Lord, we want to be right next to you. The other ten didn't like that visionary thinking of theirs. And so Jesus responds in verse 25 by reminding us, he, he showcases the, the, the leaders of the time. Says Jesus called them together and he said, You know that the, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Verse 26, not so with you instead. So so as we look at verse 25, it, it gives us a reminder of the epitome of our human nature. Well, it's all about me. It's all about mine. What can I gain? even if it's at the expense of another. As we celebrate two years, how many of us had to remind ourselves not to think about the moments when we contributed to these two years? It's not a bad thing. I'm just reminding us that our nature is to turn things and look at ourselves and think about us. Think about how it, how it makes us feel when we serve. Think about how it makes us feel when people praise us and acknowledge us for our good work. 
I stand here, I give this message, not being a hypocrite, because I myself have to work through this day after day after day. It's who we are as people. As we look at the sermon even more, as we look at the text, just a reminder consistently how much we all need Jesus. (laughs) Time and time again. Look at chapter 19, verse 27. As I said, the chapter just before this chapter, Peter's response, this is the apostle Peter. You know, one of of the strongest, one of the, the ones with the strongest leadership amongst the apostles. And he says this in verse 27, we have left everything to follow you. What then will they be for us? Peter displayed exactly the same posture that he was indignant about when James and John asked the same question, just in different words. Such hypocrites we are, isn't it? Hey, God be with us. (laughs) What will I gain from following you? He's already lived life. This is Matthew 20. They've been walking with Jesus. They've been recognizing the, the Messiahship that he comes with. And yet, dare I say he still has the audacity to say, Mara Jesus, shop, I see all the things you've done. I see who you are. But in light of everything I've sacrificed, what's going to be left for me? Church, this is us. This is us as people, whether we want to admit it or not. I want to illustrate this um, by showing you an image. Uh, I think if, if we can show... The first two. So this one. Now this is my son, by the way. A beautiful boy. There he is, representing the box, you know? Yeah. It's my beautiful wife, and that's my beautiful boy. So babies are cute, right? In what world do people not like babies? If you, if you don't like babies, or you're, I will pray for you. But like babies, it's babies. When the babies are cute. Let me show you the next picture. So like my son, our son is cute. I don't want to be that parent, but like our son is cute. Right? Like, our boy is cute. Let's stay on this picture for now. So, (laughs) babies are super adorable. Right? Like, we talk about celebrating the goodness and faithfulness of God. Man, what a privilege. What a thank you, Jesus. What a privilege. Hey, but they're a lot of work. I said to a couple of parents today, I used to think like parents were were, were over exaggerated. I used to think parents were extra. Yo, but within a month, I was like, yo. It's rough. So, so like, they're a lot of work, right? And they, they shop. They require a lot of sacrifice, commitment, devotion, unconditional love. Like, they require so much out of you. After giving everything, you're left exhausted. Let, show, let's show the next picture. So this is, uh, like, this is me on the left, my wife on the right. So these pictures were vetted. Apparently, as a husband, you don't just put any picture of your wife. So... My wife is adorable when he's with him, and I just look like, I. it's been a lot. <laughs> it's been a lot. There's a lot more pictures. But after we've given everything to these adorable creatures, yet they show their selfishness. Natural, you don't need to teach a baby to be all about them. I'd see my wife, and with my wife and my son, like this thing, I was reminded of this lesson. When I come home sometimes after a long day, And Zeta's given everything to the boy. I mean everything. To breaking point at times. And the kid just wants to take even more. He still wants to take the last ounce of life from my wife just to get what he wants. Any parents, can you say amen? Is that that true? Or is it just my son? They're like that, ne? That's how babies are. And sure, those of you who are... Devil's advocates and skeptics said, no, but they don't know what they're doing and they're developing a sense of self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, a baby wants what a baby wants. And it's about them. <laughs> it's interesting as we think about the fact that from birth, your first year of life, your first few weeks of life, that's the quality, the qualities you express and display. That's what I'm saying. Babies are just... <laughs> A small example of us. It's all about me. I might be grown up enough and intellectual enough to use language that makes it seem like I'm not selfish and I'm not about me. But at the end of the day, I know my thoughts. I know how other people made me feel about me. (laughs) We often make it about us. Even the most noble among us. Even the phantom, what is it, the phantom what? Even the phantom of the trash bins. (laughs) 
our beloved Reno. Every single one of us. And again, at the end of the day, Scripture teaches us that it's a sin problem. So as Christians, we believe we need Jesus because at the end of the day, it's a sin problem. The moment we recognize it's a sin problem, the moment we'll have a healthy perspective of how much we need a Savior, not a one-time Savior, but an ongoing Savior, until the day that Savior returns, or He calls us home. And so, again, we, we now within this context, we're reminded of then the words of Jesus, where in verse 25, He says, He calls them together, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. He's using the extreme example of those who are in leadership, who, have, who are in positions of authority. He says, they use that power and authority not to serve others more often, but to serve themselves. Some of us are thinking, yeah, it's our government. That's governments across the whole world. Because it's a sin problem. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? We mustn't be afraid to call it out. But as quickly as we call it out, we must recognize that we need, we have moments where need, we need to be saved and reminded to not make it about us, but to make it about God and about others. So Jesus is addressing amongst his, his, his disciples the this, this spirit that he saw that they displayed where they missed the point. They've been spending time with him, but they've missed the point. So then he responds, his words, verse 26, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servants. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Matthew 22, we're taught in the Scriptures, we're to love God with all our heart, soul, and minds, and we're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So yes, there are Scriptures that talk about loving ourselves. We love as an overflow of the love that we experience. It's, okay. it, it, it's a good thing. But again, the sin that often overcomes and overtakes our natural desires in this world that's all about self, it requires that much more effort to go back to God consistently and say, Lord, forgive me when I've made it about myself. Help me to make it about you and about your people. That's what this morning is about. Serve like Jesus. We've seen in this story, I'm going to reference another scripture, Jesus and, 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 the, and, and the personality and the person that he was, he sacrificed everything to come here for you and me. The gospel message is that Jesus lived a sinless life and he, he, he accepted an unfair judgment where he did nothing wrong, but we did something wrong, and he took our punishment. That's the gospel message of a Jesus and a Savior who gave it all up so that you and I could stand a chance at having reconciliation in a relationship with God. The gospel message is central to any church that proclaims to believe in Jesus. No conversation can be had of, of great work in two years and you're doing such a good job and you're leading worship so well. No conversation can be had that negates the need for Jesus and that all of this has come about because of Jesus. And so this morning is a simple message, but it's an important message that we need to remind ourselves literally every day that it's not about us and that it's about Him. We are to serve like Jesus. We are to become servants. They even use the word to become a slave to others, to one another. We're to lay down our lives for one another. As a church family, we're to lay down our lives for others, sometimes for strangers and even yet sometimes for enemies. Jesus reminds us in the kingdom economy, in the God economy, it's about others before it's about us. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. Serving like Jesus starts with recognizing that truth. Okay, so then we may ask the question, so who is it about? We mentioned it's about others. But more importantly, it is about Jesus. So our second point, it's all about Jesus. Shocker, at church that's what we told. <laughs> it's obvious, right? You'd think. You'd hope. But we as people, even those who have been in the church for a long time, 
we sometimes forget it's about Jesus, don't we? So before you think about somebody else, you say, ah, no, tell, I must tell that person when I get home. Hey, the pastor this morning said, it's all about Jesus, it's not about you. Before you even go there, remind yourself. This is a message for you and I at an individual capacity before we even get to it at a corporate level as a church. It's all about Jesus. 1 John 4 verse, verse 19 tells us that we love because he first loved us. So our ability to care for others always starts with the complete and full love of recognizing a love that comes from God. Yes, we can love. We can even love well. But loving outside of God's love is an incomplete, compromised, and tainted kind of love. Because we love with, with our insecurities. I love my wife based on the experiences I've had growing up. The insecurities I have will flare up from time to time. That's why I need to love not with the depth of my perfect and unending love, because it's flawed. I love with the perfected love of the source and originator of love. You understand? So, so that's why Matthew 20, when, 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 when Jesus, they're trying to trick him and they ask him, which is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor like yourself. But it started with love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So again, in a conversation where we're talking about living in this world and, and serving and all these other things, it must always go back to God. Even the best qualities that we have, our abilities to be loving and, and present parents, friends, spouses, even that, if not from and through God's love, is incomplete and flawed. And naturally, we're going to have the problems we have in this world. It's all about Jesus. The gospel message for the Christian is reminded, or it's us being reminded, that we can never talk too much about Jesus. It's a good point, because we often think, hey, when I stop talking about Jesus so much, we get it. Right? In your house, you must talk about Jesus. <laughs> In your friend groups, you must talk about Jesus. In your own personal capacity, with all the aspirations you have, it must start with Jesus. Again, because He is our God, our Creator. He is our originator. And Jesus is that one perfect solution from God to help address our sin shortcomings. Have a look at verse 17 to 19, where our story started where Jesus then says he was going up to Jerusalem, he took them up, he took the twelve aside, he said to them, we're going to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day he will be raised to life. That is the gospel. He gave them the gospel. Do you see how they responded? Then Zebedee's mom came to Jesus, kneeling before them, he, she asked for a favor. May the, 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 the importance of the gospel never, may, may never be lost on us. So I'm saying, when I say it's all about Jesus, that all, I wanted to capitalize it so that the others were small case and the all was, was caps letters. Because in every facet of our lives, it, it's possible that today, when we are celebrating two years as a church, that this afternoon, we fall short. It's what happens because it's us. We're human. It's sin. We miss the mark, which is what sin is. So Jesus was sharing the gospel. Matthew 1, 21, the birth of Jesus, the, 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 the foretelling of the birth of Jesus. He shall give birth to a son, the angel said. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' mission on this earth was to address the biggest problem for humanity, which was sin. We can't have any other conversations until we address the sin problem. And that statement is not only for non-believers. It's for us. 
as Christians, because as we serve more and more, it, it doesn't work like a one-time, so it's a one-time sacrifice that covers our sins for all, but sin is always pervasive, as Paul says. He struggles with it day and day. I want to read Romans 5, verse 6 to 11, and then we'll transition from the gospel. But let's read this together. Well, you don't have to read it out loud. Like, follow with me. Romans 5, 6 to 11, verse 6. You see, at the right time, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. As Christians, this is our foundation. This is our belief. As a gospel-centered church, this is what we believe. Two years in, we must talk about the fact that we're a gospel-centered church. We must remind one another what the gospel is. Because as we move forward, that's our base and that's what sends us out. Outside of Jesus, this wouldn't happen. Outside of the cross and the work and the sacrificial work of Jesus, it would mean nothing. Some of us would be on a completely different path were it not for Jesus. Many of us, the only meaningful thing we have in common this morning is Jesus. Look around. For some of us, the only thing that we have in common, otherwise many of us would have never met Jesus. And that's a good thing. Zita and our lives were better when we came into this church community. Your lives are better when you're surrounded by like-minded believers chasing after the same thing. May we never forget that for some of us, our testimony is that outside of Jesus intervening in our lives, we would be dead and we wouldn't be here this morning. The gospel is life and death, friends. It's not a nice-to-have conversation. A true appreciation and understanding of the gospel is, I would be a different man this morning in 2023 were it not for Jesus. Which means my wife has a godly husband because of Jesus. Which means my son is going to grow up with a father who is conscious of living for others and caring for others because of Jesus. Do you understand the ripple effects? The gospel is everything. It's all about Jesus. The pastor and the leaders that Reno and Lesero are and the godly men that they are are because of Jesus. It's not because inherently they're good people. In fact, it's the opposite. It's all about Jesus. If you think about it. Every part of your life as a Christian business owner, a number of you would say, yo, the success I have, were it not for Jesus, I would have just been another guy with an idea. May we never forget that outside of Jesus, outside of our utter desperation for him, we would be nowhere. So, what that means for us as Christians then, again, it's for Christians. If you're not a Christian, ignore what I said. Pick up one or two things, it's fine. We can talk afterwards. For the Christian, Fellowship City, if you're aligned to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all of this matters. For us as a church, we then respond by keeping it about Jesus. So to the Fellowship City leadership, to all those who are serving, as I'm speaking this morning to you all, you are here and you've seen two years because you've kept your eyes on Jesus. You've made it all about Jesus. You will thrive for another 20 years if you continue to keep Jesus at the center. Yeah, <laughs> if you continue to make it about him. Yeah. The moment you start making it about yourselves, <laughs> you're going to be skating on thin ice. As an individual Christian, as a family, if you keep it all about Jesus, you will thrive. 
It's not to say you won't experience hardships and life won't be hard. It is to say, our Lord and Savior, our Creator, will be with you every step of the way. So when we talk kingdom life, it's about serving. It's about looking at Jesus. It's about learning from Him. As we transition then to our third and final point, I think we have Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 11 up there. I'd love for us to read it together. Again, we're looking to Jesus and we learn from Him the ultimate example. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not only looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Another version says, something to be held onto, something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. Oh, nope, that's a different verse. At the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, under the earth. Oh, there we go. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. We look to Jesus. We look to Jesus. You can never go wrong if your bearing and your default and your tether is always to say, okay, Jesus, this is what I see from you. This is what I learned from you. Now I respond. You live life. You live life. Okay, now Jesus, okay, what do the scriptures say? How did you handle this? What's your character? And then you go out and you live the world. As you handle every situation, whether it's work, whether it's your family, whether it's in your personal life, you won't go wrong if you keep going back to the character and to the person of Jesus. If you keep going back to the ultimate example of the perfect, the perfect man, the perfect human who lived a perfect life, who said, this is how I live my life. I sacrifice all royalty. This verse, by the way, saying he was at the status of God. He didn't hold on to that. He gave it up so that he could come and do what? And serve. You and I are here because Jesus served us. He gave up his life for us to be here. John 13, at your own time, being conscious of the time, at your own time, go and read it, verse 12 to 17. It's a story where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. The Messiah, God himself, serves his disciples. But not only that, I heard one preacher talk about the fact that, remember, back then, feet, walking, was their means of transport. So talk about having horrible feet. So the washing of feet was the ultimate example that the last will be first. If you want to be great, become a servant to your brother or sister. He knelt down, took a towel, he washed their feet one by one. In the story, in John 13, then he says, Now that I, that I the Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. This morning, we're to serve like Jesus. As a church, as you move forward, we listen to his words and we watch his actions. Therefore, serve others, our third and final point. Serve others like Jesus. For those of you who may be Bible nerds, the definition of the word serve, just quickly in the Greek, is the word diakoneo, which means to attend to someone. It's almost like a waiter waiting at someone's table. That's the definition of serving. So when you think about serving, again, we've seen it in Jesus' life, but this notion of serving comes with understanding. You, you, your purpose as a waiter or waitress then, right, is, is to wait at the table with your towel, with your notepad. Your task when you're on shift is to do what? To wait at their table, to serve them. When you clock off, you become your own person. But while you've clocked in and you're serving, you're there to tend to every need that they have. That's the definition of serving. So then we understand if Jesus gave up his life, his life wasn't valuable to him because yours was more valuable. That's the definition of, of, of serving that we should embody. You give up yourself to the point of death if necessary. And so then, Philippians 2, John 13, and in fact, even in our story, verse 29 to 34, Jesus is walking out. 
The crowd then sees these blind individuals who then start shouting out and asking Jesus to help them. Look at the response of the crowd. The crowd rebuked them in verse 31 and told them to be, to be quiet. They shouted out the louder. What does that mean? What do I see when I read that in the story, in the text? I'm thinking to myself, I've come to church to listen to the preacher or to receive from God's word. And then I bump into some people who now are making a noise outside. Maybe even inside the church. They're making a noise because they desperately need help. And me and my selfishness, I'm like, hey, I'm going to keep quiet. I'm here to receive from God. So we think, yes, it's honorable. They wanted to receive from the Messiah. But Jesus says, not at the expense of, the expense of somebody else. So Jesus stops everything, asks them how he can help them, and then he helps them. We must learn from Jesus. So as we think at our own lives, as we think about our own lives, what are the moments in our lives where we are going somewhere, we have an objective, we're about to accomplish something, and then there's a disruption? How often do we think, hey, what an inconvenience, and then we keep moving? That's physical, that, that, that's figurative and literal. The key there is the posture. What is your posture as you live life? See, because again, this teaching that Jesus gave them, it could have been very easy for him to say, okay, go do the same, he walks away, and then he does his own things. But the very next story we see, Jesus slows down to stop whatever mission he was on to meet the needs of those who were needy. Again, it looks like three different stories, but it's the same. It's all about seeing someone else and valuing them. Philippians 2, 3, and 4, it says, don't only look out for your own interests. Church, it's not saying you neglect your own family to serve others. No. But it says, think about others as much as you think about yourself. We, again, if there's one thing you take away from this is, let's remember to look to Jesus and to live as Jesus lived. My prayer for us this morning is we would ask God through His Spirit to reveal to us opportunities to serve. And by the way, look at this. As I said, in this story, verse 29 to 34, immediately after the teaching, Jesus walked out and there was this opportunity to serve. When you leave church today, nine times out of ten, there will be an opportunity to serve. Oh, wait a minute. Before you even leave, here, yeah, while you're still in the church premises, you know how many Christians lose their salvation in the parking lot after church? <laughs> you laugh because you know. <laughs> At our church currently, we have a lot of elderly folks. Yo! The parking lot on a Sunday morning, into church and out of church, it's the same. Danger. Danger physically and literally, but then in speech. And then people say things and then they enter church like they said nothing. I attended a mega church. I attended Rhema when I was in university years ago. And one of the most fascinating things for me, I don't know if you guys have been to Rhema, like a mega church with like big parking. It's like a mall and everybody's leaving at the same time. So there's car guards and people helping facilitate. But now people clearly have plans after church. And so they don't want to have grace to let somebody else go in. If somebody goes in before them, they have choice words ready for them. You just heard the gospel. Or maybe you didn't. It came in and it went out the other way. So, so, so church, this morning, we are to look at Jesus. Time and time again, he always was sensitive to his surroundings. He always was conscious of others. Day to day, may you as individuals, may you as a church, look to him. Remember that you're here because of him and then aspire to live out the servant heart that he had, which was the person who I interact with is so valuable to me that if I need to give my life, I should. Again, we're not talking theoretical, philosophical stuff. Jesus lived it. Jesus put his words to action. So, so may God help us. And the thing I love about community is 
Your church community is there for you to hold one another accountable. It's not to say you must be perfect all the time. One of us here is going to shout at someone today when they leave. It's not to say they're less Christian than us. It's just to say it's a sin problem. And we need Jesus to help us every single day. We start internally, we look externally, and then we go out. So practically... Just a few quick practical, what does this look like for me today? Means you serve your family and your loved ones. Means you make time for your family. It means you speak kindly to your children. It means you're not hostile to your unpleasant colleagues at work. It means you take interest in your neighbors, your literal neighbors. (laughs) Means you ask your brother or sister in Christ at church how they're doing. See one another. Know one another. It means as a church you know the needs of the community and you you, you actively take action. It may cost you money as a church. It may cost you time as a church. It may make you uncomfortable as a church. What does it practically mean to serve others? It means we're being salt and light in this dark world. That's why we, that's how we respond to God's faithfulness and goodness, by taking Jesus to the world and serving them. As we serve, people see Jesus, people experience Jesus. As I said, it's a sin problem. You, you name whatever disaster is happening in the world in the news headlines. It's a sin problem. We can't expect dialogue around a table from high-ranking officials across the world to solve a sin problem, which means for us as Christians, we appreciate better than most that Jesus as the solution means I must be part of the conversations where Jesus is revealed through me. May we ask God through His Spirit to use us as we serve. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, what a privilege, Lord, it is this morning to look to you through our entire service, Lord, looking to you, Father, praising you, thanking you. Thank you, Lord, that as we celebrate, you give us a task and you give us a mission. There's much kingdom work to be done. And so, Lord, may you you help each one of us to understand what you were saying this morning, Lord, personally and corporately as a church. So I pray for each person that's in this room, Lord, the different places they're at with you, the different scenarios and the different things they're going through in their lives, Lord. May they turn to you May you show them the way. May you reveal to us what we ought to do, whatever we're facing in our lives. Thank you for living a life that showed us how it's supposed to be done. Thank you, Lord, that in 2023, we can open up our Bibles, look at your life, and emulate what you did and who you were. So I pray for Fellowship City, Lord. This morning, Father, we thank you for two amazing years. We pray that they may keep their eyes firmly fixed on you, Lord Jesus. That they may never forget that you are the reason they exist. I pray that as they step into the next stage and season with all the visions and the ideas, Lord, being with you impressing on their hearts what they're to do, that one thing that will remain is that you are true north. It's all about you, Lord Jesus, that they may be a church and a people that radiate Jesus himself. So I pray this morning, Father, that you may bless this church (laughs) mightily so for everyone that comes into this premises, Lord, 
that your presence may just be so evident that no one comes into this church unchanged, Lord. Not because of the amazing people in the church, but because of the amazing God in this church. I pray for the leadership, Father. You lift up Reno, Lesero, and all the other leaders. I pray, Lord, that you may keep them and protect them, Father. I pray for their families, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you may continue to, to, to cover them, Lord, for the work that is done here doesn't come without opposition, Lord. And so we pray for many more years. We pray for much more impact. We pray for more of hearing from you, being led by your Spirit. Bless this church and bless those that are in this church. All for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.